Okay, what's up, everybody? Um, get your Bible out. <laughs> get your Bible out, get a pen ready, get a highlighter ready, maybe. Um, this is going to be slightly structured and slightly just me freestyling it. Um, I was doing, I was led to just do a lot of Bible study today and you know, it's funny. I started off um, rereading the book of Jude, seeking further clarification and revelation on that because I wanted to teach it. Well, God wants me to teach it. He wants me to reteach it a third time now. Um, but it's like every time I go there, I end up going and being led to like something else. So I started off initially um, seeking regarding the book of Jude, but that's still on the shelf and bottom line we're going to talk about the topic of tithing um as well as the true priesthood of the fivefold ministry um yada 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 there's three points the lord wants me to make but i would just i would i've spent a i don't even know how many hours today just in study um in the book of malachi and i was jumping around researching like what stuff was like referencing in like the book of uh, the the book of numbers and um i was led to hebrews and um you know and i was updating my little chart here of the categories of people and just getting further clarification praise god for the clarity um so let's just open in prayer Get your Bible out. Father God, Yahweh, Holy Spirit, Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, I just praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your revelation. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity. In the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, Lord, I ask, will you please fill me up afresh, overflowing with your Holy Spirit? I ask, Lord, in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, will you please cut a hot coal over my tongue and prevent me from saying anything that's not true and not coming from you, Father God, Yahweh, Yeshua, Holy Spirit? I ask, Lord... Um, will, will you please just bring your presence right now, Lord? Will you please, um, I, I just, in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, I invite, I request further revelation, Lord, even spontaneously, if that's how you want to roll today, Lord. Um, I invite conviction, I invite revelation, and in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, I plead the blood of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth over my entire domain and all, all that that includes, and in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, I release and loose the, whole, the, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth to all of those who will watch and listen to this video. I ask, Lord, in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth, that you will have this video reach people who you want it to reach, Lord. Amen. I pray, Lord, that you would humble people and convict people through this video, Lord. I ask for this in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Okay. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling excited. Um, because this is, this, is, this is significant. This is very significant. And I'm very excited about all these little revelations, all these little clarifications that the Lord just gave me. So, um, a little while back on this channel, I... Uh, did a video and I, I might just redo that video uh, where I showed you in Microsoft Excel I made a little chart of um, a, a visual because having a visual makes things easier for people I know it makes it easier for me um, and the Lord has had me updating this with the more revelation that he gives me and I definitely just updated it and so um, in the description box below I will be putting a link uh, to my Google Drive for this Microsoft Excel sheet um, of the categories of people uh, because I have added to it and I really do um, exhort you to go download it and even print it out if you'd like um, because this really does bring a lot of things into clarity and I'm just so excited about it um, and it also kind of like indirectly references the revelation that God gave me on the seven churches of revelation that Yeshua addresses in the book of Revelation, there's a pattern there. He goes through all these different, uh, well, they're called churches, but they're really just categories of people in terms of where they stand regarding God, their heart posture, etc. cetera. Um, Lord, I'm so excited. Where do you want me to start, Lord? Where do you want me to start? Um, okay, so let's just recall the three points you wanted me to make, Lord. The three points were about the priesthood. Um, they were about taking the scripture out of context in Malachi um, and um, and about tithing. Right, 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 right. Okay. Well, wh which, where do you want me to go first, Lord? Uh, Malachi? Yeah, okay. So, 
Let's go to Malachi, okay? Malachi is one of the minor prophets. It is the last book of the Old Testament. So it is before Matthew, okay? Let's go to, Ma to, to Malachi. It's only a few pages long. And let's read the passage that the modern-day, institutionalized, infiltrated, wicked churches, tax-exempt, 5013C, tax-exempt, bowing to the government, quote-unquote, brick-and-mortar churches, what they have been twisting, okay? Because I had this shoved down my throat when I was a babe in Christ, and I know you have too, probably, okay? So let's go to Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? And the Lord answers, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That is the passage, right? That they shove down everybody's throats and say, you got to pay us, you know, 10% of your paycheck, right? And they even try to motivate you and say, oh, you can, you can write this off your taxes and get a tax return, which is bull dinky because unless you, unless you make a lot of money and therefore your 10% is a lot of amount money, it doesn't count towards getting a tax return, okay? In all the years that I ever tithed in, in the past, it never counted towards getting any, uh, towards increasing my tax return at all, ever. Um, not that we should be giving to get, okay? Um, but I'm, I'm just stating facts here, okay? Well, here's the thing. We need to read and ask the Lord for revelation, right? And you got to read the whole book. You got to read the whole book of Malachi. Now, I'm not going to read the whole book of Malachi for you. You can do that yourself, okay? But I am just going to go through and highlight some verses. And Lord, I just ask Yeshua, Yahweh, Holy Spirit, will you please prevent me, Lord, from forgetting anything Will you please pre prevent me from rushing too fast? Lord, will you please slow me down? <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, it's so exciting, Lord, when you give clarity, when you give revelation and insight. Um, will you please just prevent me, Lord, from going too fast and from forgetting anything that you want me to say, Lord. But I also ask that you would prevent me from saying anything you don't want me to say. Amen. Okay, um, yeah, so let's just go to the beginning of Malachi, okay, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight certain verses so that you can pick up on the theme here, the context here of what this prophet was saying, okay? So let's just start off um, chapter 1 um, in verse 6, and he's talking, he says, To you priests who despise my name, okay, to you priests who despise my name. That's interesting. So we're getting some context here that this book is talking about maybe some, some you know, modern day people who are ordaining themselves and they're not God ordained. Um, I'm going to jump around a lot. I hope you can keep up with me. I'm going to try, <laughs> uh, try here to make this all make sense. Um, okay. Let's see what else here. Um, what else, Lord? What else jumps out here? Okay, now, if we go to chapter 2 in the book of Malachi, um, in this King James, or New King James Version, um, the little, like, subtitle for the chapter, it says, Corrupt Priests, okay? And if you read it, you know, it's, it's it, uh, in verse 4, it says, My covenant with Levi that may continue. My covenant with Levi that may continue. And then in verse 8, you have corrupted the covenant of Levi. Now, for those of you who don't know, okay, there were 12 tribes of Israel. The Levites were the priests, okay? They were the priesthood back in the Old Testament. And there's a lot of metaphoric and symbolic stuff from the Old Testament that applies now today more spiritually, not literally, okay? Everyone likes to get hung up on, um, like, physical, tangible bloodlines, um, in terms of the tribes and who's a Gentile and all that. And God doesn't care about that, okay? We're told in the New Testament that there is neither Jew nor Gentile in, um, in the New Covenant, in Christ, etc., okay? Um, 
All right, Laura, do you want me to just pause here? Okay, so let's just pause here and extrapolate, unpack this covenant of Levi. So I did a little research. If you go back into the book of Numbers, okay, uh, there was a priest, Phineas, and he was basically uh, Aaron's grandson, okay? Aaron was the original, uh, I guess you could say, Levite, <laughs> And um, all of his descendants, in terms of the actual flesh bloodlines, the tribes, all of his descendants was the tribe of Levite, okay? Um, so his grandson, Phineas, um, God made a covenant with him, and it was basically for all of the Levites, okay? All of his descendants um, regarding, you know, that, that there would be life and peace and so forth, okay? And that's mentioned here in Malachi, it's referenced and so forth. Um, and, um, Lord, do you want me to get into the whole thing with the marriage and all that? No, okay. Um, you can go read all that for yourself. And if you're, if you're wondering, I mean, just Google it really that that's what I did. If you're wondering where in numbers we're talking about, let me find my bookmark. Where in numbers it's, um, it's numbers chapter 25. If you want to go, uh, research that and find out what it's talking about basically um the men were fornicating with or marrying the women of moab which i believe the lord told me were nephilim which is why the lord was so upset about it and so phineas went and um killed this man and his nephilim wife and that's how the uh plague that came was you know taken away and this that and the other blah 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 okay I'm not going to get into all that right now, but if you want to go research that, you can go research that. Okay, moving on. Continuing on in Malachi chapter 2. Um, in reference to that, uh, it says here he seeks godly offspring. It's a very interesting statement. It's a very interesting phrase. And what is what is being talked about here, what that means is that God is looking for his DNA, his seed. Okay, so there's... There's um, fallen angel people DNA. I haven't really gotten into that yet because I'm still, I'm not feeling quite confident enough to teach on all that just yet. But there's there's basically, co there's corrupt DNA. There's corrupt that comes from, the corrupt DNA that comes from the fallen angels. And then there's God's seed, God's DNA, okay, the image of God. Um, and so that, that's what's being talked about here in verse 15, Malachi 2.15. He seeks godly offspring, which is why back in Numbers, 25 God is all upset that the men were mixing with these other women because these other women had fallen angel DNA they were Nephilim okay um now that's that's besides the point it's not the point of this video um okay continuing on chapter 3 in Malachi he will purify the sons of Levi um now I want you to pay attention that throughout this book of Malachi which is not long at all there seems to be a focus on Levi, the tribe of Levi, the descendants of Levi, the sons of Levi, the priests of Levi, okay? Or Levites. Um, now, in, in chapter 3 in Malachi, in verse 5, it says, against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit, exploit, do I need to define that, Laura? Do you want me to define that? Let's 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 get a def definition. Let's let's pull up the definition of exploit. Exploit definition. Make full use of and derive benefit from. I mean, you can do that in a positive way. Um, that's not a good definition. That's not a good definition at all. Okay, anyway. Um, to exploit, yes, it means to take advantage of and all that, but it means um, in with like, like unrighteously doing so, okay? Um, to exploit those, uh, excuse me, to exploit wage earners and widows and orphans. Now, yes, you can talk about orphans in the sense of, you know, uh, they physically didn't have a mommy and daddy, but there's, there's, um, there's other types of orphans, you know, there's, there's people that they just, um, they don't have any support system and so on and so forth, okay, as many of us can relate to these days, including myself, right? 
Um, okay, and, and, you know, then we get to the passage here that we all know, you know, that they shoved down our throats, you know, about robbing God and how God wants to have food in his house, in his house, food in his house. Okay, um, and then if you continue on in verse 14, Malachi chapter 3, verse 14, um, you have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, right? So what is being said here? What is being demonstrated here? Um, God is speaking through this prophet and he's, he's basically exposing their hearts, their motives, their characters. And he's saying these people who are calling themselves priests or pastors, shepherds, right? They're calling themselves leaders of the flock in some way, shape or form, okay? That they are looking for what? Profit. Are you supposed to be profiting off God or off his people? No, right? Okay, so you got to look at the whole context here. And then it continues on in verse 15. So now we call the proud blessed for those who do wicked are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Okay, what do you think this is talking about? Okay, let me answer the question for you. This is talking about, this is referring to the end times about how there would be these tax exempt bowing to the government 5013c um infiltrated quote unquote churches these brick and mortar churches and they are full of pride they appoint themselves when god never appointed them he never ordained them in the office of pastor um he never appointed them he never ordained them they they have a lot of pride in their hearts because some of them aren't even his seed some of them are fallen angel people some of them are nephilim some of them are witches and warlocks okay freemasons etc okay so now we call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness are raised up they even tempt god and go free but we you and i know ultimately they're not going to go free because god has the final say on judgment day right Okay, then here's what's interesting. It continues on at the end of chapter 3, starting in verse 17. Um, and, and this is talking about those, well, maybe I'll just start off. Uh, let's just start in verse 16. Then those, then, meaning something's happening next. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before them for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Verse 18. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Now, back in 2020, and I'm, I'm just going to share this because it might be insightful to somebody else out there that maybe the Lord spoke to you in a similar way and it went over your head, okay? Um, so back in 2020, I was trying to figure out, um, like I, I, long before I got like the full revelation on the seven churches i knew that they were heart postures i didn't have the full revelation as to like breaking down each verse as i eventually did but i knew that they were heart postures and i said to the lord i said lord what what church am i you know and um i came across a word of knowledge through someone's uh youtube channel and they they had a specific word of knowledge for someone with the name april and it was you are second uh the the word of knowledge was second to last and it took me, I think, a day or two to figure it out. But the Lord told me, okay, go read the passage again on the seven churches. And the Church of Philadelphia was the second to last church. And he was telling me, you're the Church of Philadelphia. Well, I'm not kidding you. A day or two ago, I was literally sitting in this chair right here. And the Lord said to me, I want you to listen. I said, okay, Lord, I'm listening. And he said, you are a jewel. And I was like, well, that's very nice, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> you know, like, but like, it didn't click. I didn't know that, that he was referencing. Well, now he leads me to this today, verse 17, on the day that I make them my jewels, okay? Now the revelation that I believe the Lord gave me is that the people he's talking about right here at the end of chapter 3 in Malachi, and then this is for the last days, okay, is the church of Philadelphia, okay? 
Now, if you go back and you reference my teaching on the seven churches of Revelation, the church of Philadelphia are the only people who will see, well, first of all, they're the only people that, that Jesus does not rebuke, okay? Um, it says that there's there's no lies on their lips or, or, or their tongue, okay? They, they are a pure heart. They have a pure heart, right? And uh, we could even reference the um, Beatitudes. I forget exactly what it says about those who have a pure heart. They will see God. Isn't that what it, Let's pull that up. Beatitudes, pure heart. Pretty sure it says that they will see God. Yeah. Not even, you know what? That even makes sense. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Matthew 5, 8. That fits, that fits even more. That's a confirmation even more. Okay, hallelujah. Um, okay, so Philadelphia, the Church of Philadelphia, they have pure hearts. They will see God, and this fits perfectly. The Church of Philadelphia are the only ones who will see Jesus coming in the clouds. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. This is so cool. So cool. Um, okay. I'm excited. Can you tell? <laughs> so going back to my chart of the categories of people, right? So you've got the Holy of Holies, the 144,000, which is the Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia. And within the Church of Philadelphia, you have the group of the two witnesses, okay? Well, here's what the Lord has been showing me recently about the Church of Philadelphia. Um, so he recently told me that they are all targeted individuals regarding gang stalking and all that. Um... But here's what I just really figured out. So these jewels that he's talking about in Malachi 3.17, that is the Church of Philadelphia, okay? And, um, okay, Lord, do we want to get into Hebrews now? Okay, they are also the fivefold ministry priesthood that has actually um, stepped into their office been launched in it been activated in it been empowered in it but i'm getting ahead of myself here oh so let's i'm sorry i'm jumping all over let's finish malachi um okay so yes yeah, so malachi 3 17 and 18 and even the beginning of chapter 4 i believe the lord told me is about the church of philadelphia um they will judge they will discern between the righteous and the wicked between who serves god and who does not serve him okay Starting in uh, and now uh, chapter 4. Um, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch, but to you who fear my name, the Church of Philadelphia, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. Okay, now starting in verse 4 and verse 5, now we're, gonna, and, and the, now we're talking about the two witnesses. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, for uh, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, which the statutes and judgments, excuse me, with the statutes and judgments. And then verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the, children of children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Okay, now, I, some of you, or maybe all of you, don't get, well, I'm so excited, but this, this is all going to fit together, just, just, Stay with me here. Okay, so let me put the bookmark back there. Okay. Um, and of course, my stomach's starting to give me some issues right now while I'm recording, of course. Um, okay. Father God, Yahweh, I ask in the name of Yeshua, the Christ of Nazareth, will you please just deal with my di digestive issues right now, Lord, please, while I'm doing this. Okay. Um, so let's go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 7, okay? Now, chapter 7 in Hebrews references Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, you can go do your own study in the Old Testament, but Mel Melchizedek is what is called a theophany. Now, I know most of you have probably never heard that word before. I learned it when I took survey of Old Testament. It's one of the few things I actually retained in my, my memory from that class. Um, but a theophany... Theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-O-N-Y. Theophany is when Christ appears in the Old Testament 
like physically appears, like in the flesh, right? So Melchizedek is a theophany, and we're going to get into some scripture here that talks about that, um, or that unpacks that. And then you could also say that the angel that Jacob wrestled with, people say that that was a theophany, okay? Okay, um, so let's just read. Uh, I'll be honest, I found reading it in the message a lot easier to comprehend than I did the New King James Version. And um, so I hope you don't mind. I think I'm going to read it out of the message. Um, or maybe I'll read both. Let's read both. Okay, so let's, let's read. How far do we want to go here, Lord? I guess we're going to read... Now I'm wondering if I should have just read more further before I hit record. Maybe I will continue. Okay, we, we might just read the whole chapter, the whole chapter 7 of Hebrews. Appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Okay. All right. Um, or do you want me to read the New King James? Just go to the message. All right. Yeah, we're, we're just going to read the message. So Hebrews chapter 7. Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of the highest God. He met Abraham, who was returning from the royal massacre, and gave him his blessing. Abraham, in turn, gave him a tenth of the spoils. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Salem means peace. So, he also, king of peace... That wasn't a complete sentence there. Anyway, okay. Mel Melchizedek towers out of the past without record of family ties, no account of being of, of beginning or end. In this way, he is like the son of God, one, one huge priestly presence dominating the landscape always. I'm going to go read the New King James Version of that. Okay. Um, Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Who remains a priest continually? Christ does, okay? This is a theophany. Mel Melchizedek was a theophany. Okay. Um, let's continue on. You realize just how great Melchizedek is when you see that the father Abraham gave him a tenth of the captured treasure. Priests descended from Levi are commanded by law to collect tithes from the people, even though they are more or less equals. Priests and people have a common father in Abraham. Okay, meaning we're all sinners, right? But this man, a complete outsider, Melchizedek, Theophany, Christ, collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him, the one to whom the promises had been given. In acts of blessing, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Or, look at it this way. We pay our tithes to priests who die, but Abraham pa pa paid tithes to a priest who the scripture says lives. Ultimately, you could even say that since Levi descended from Abraham, who paid tithes to Melchizedek, when we pay tithes to the priestly tribe of Levi, they end up with, Mel they end up with Melchizedek. That's not really phrased great um all right so let me read this from the new king james now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch uh abraham gave a tenth of the spoils and indeed those who are those who are of the sons of levi 
who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy was not derived from them, he being Melchizedek, Theophany, Christ, them being the Levites, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Okay, so let's just put this into layman's terms here, okay? This is what I believe the Lord told me just now. And I've put off teaching on this for a long time because comp trying to comprehend scripture, this can get a little complex, you know. Um, here's what I believe. I believe that the Lord told me the following, okay? He does ordain people, and he gave me his definition for ordain today. It just means that when God wills something, okay? When God wills something, when God ordains something, he can ordain people in an office. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're ever going to actually... Um, be launched, activated, or empowered in that office. Because um, if they are not repenting, pursuing, and are healing, if they are not aligning with him, if they are not obeying him, etc., if, if they are not making him Lord, then they may never progress into the Holy of Holies and into the Church of Philadelphia, okay? Um, there's a woman that I know of, and I, I do believe that God had, you know, used me to tell her that he ordained her for a five-fold office, but at, at that point in time, she was in the inner court. She still had not made him Lord in all areas of her life, um, and if she continues on that way, she'll never really get to fulfill her office because you have to be in the Holy of Holies. You have to have made him Lord, um, and not only do you have to be in the Holy of Holies, but you have to be in the Church of Philadelphia. So you have to progress from the outer court to the inner court, so basically from the outer court to the Church of Smyrna, and you have to go from the Church of Smyrna to the Church of Philadelphia. Or, I mean, you could just go directly into the Church of Philadelphia from the inner court. Um, but bottom line, you got to get to the point where you have made him Lord completely, completely meek, completely surrendered, completely submitted. Um, that is how you become a jewel. That is how you get to the point where the Lord starts to launch you and activate you and empower you in your office if you have an office, okay? Um, actually, excuse me, let me correct myself. Um, I believe the Lord told me that everyone in the Church of Philadelphia is part of the fivefold ministry, also known as the priesthood, okay? So the priesthood is not just the office of pastor, it is all five of the offices. Um, and I'm kind of delighted to be refreshed on this passage today because I have endured so much persecution. Um, from people, from mostly Nephilim, big surprise, about, um, you know, simply making my financial need known and the Lord telling me that I'm in fivefold ministry and, uh, or, or excuse me, well, yes, that too, but, but uh, that I'm in full-time ministry. Um, it says it right here. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, meaning those who are in the Church of Philadelphia, those who are a part of the fivefold ministry, those who are part of the priesthood, those who are the jewels, and also the targeted individuals, those who are the bride of Christ, those who are the elect, those who are the barley, okay, those who will witness the Lord come in the clouds unless they're part of the two witnesses, okay, those who are the sons of Levi, I'm, I'm going to put that in here too, sons of Levi, um, who receive the priesthood through their obedience, through their meekness, through their submission and their surrender to the Lord, okay, have a commandment. So all y'all out there who love to persecute me, make sure you hear this. Listen up. Have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren. Though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So the Church of Philadelphia is the priesthood they are the fivefold ministers they are the jewels again they are the barley they are the elect they are the bride of christ they are also targeted individuals we are supposed to be, those who are in this category which is myself we are supposed to be receiving financial assistance from our brethren from the church of smyrna from those in the inner court 
Okay, and I, I'm just gonna flat out, Lord, do I have permission to say this finally? Yes, thank you. I'm just gonna flat out come out and say it now. Okay, the inner court, God considers those people, he, he told me this a couple months ago, he considers the people in the inner court, the basically the, the fake Christians, the lukewarm Christians, okay? Um, he considers them the tares. He considers them the devil's people. And even though they call themselves a Christian and maybe they wear a cross and maybe they even have a cross tattoo and whatever and a fish sticker on their car and whatever, okay? doesn't matter. That also, you know, that, that verse in Proverbs that says that the, um, the wealth of the wicked will be stored up for the righteous, that's part of this as well, okay? People in the inner court who don't want to pursue inner healing, they don't want to make Jesus actually Lord in their life, um, those, those are part of the people that are to be funding those in the Church of Philadelphia, the fivefold priesthood. That's part of the wealth transfer. That's part of the wealth of the wicked stored up for the righteous. And interesting that that verse says stored up. And interesting that in Malachi, let's go back to Malachi, it says... God specifically says his storehouse. And he specifically says food in his house. Now, yeah, you, you could go a lot of different directions as to what, you know, what could be applied here, what the definition, what the meaning could be here, okay? But part of this is that people who are not in the priesthood, who are not the jewels, who are not Philadelphia, not the bride, not the elect, not the barley, um, who are not the targeted individuals, they are to be providing food for those in the priesthood, the sons of Levi, the church of Philadelphia, okay? Um, now, if you go back and you study in the Old Testament, you know, about, um, you know, if you go into the law and all that, and I don't believe God told me to get into all that right now, but, you know, basically God designed that whole thing so that there would never be people who went without. He set it up in such a way so that, um, yes, his Levites, his priesthood would be provided for, yes, but also just in general, that if, if there was ever a need, that need could be brought up and then there would be you know, um, financial assistance, economic assistance, food, and, and so forth for those who were in need. And, you know, God has a heart for the widows and the orphans. He says it right here in Malachi chapter, or, yeah, chapter 3, verse 5, right? But he doesn't want wage earners being exploited, okay? He doesn't want his people being exploited. Um, but this, this all just ties in together. And so, anyway, the point of this video is that this passage of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, that has been shoved down everyone's throats as to why you're supposed to give 10% of your paycheck or whatever to the institutionalized church that bows down to the government. Which, by the way, those churches, they've been promoting the mark. And at some point, I mean, people have had dreams about how these churches are going to be in cahoots with the government and they're going to turn people over to be uh, beheaded, you know, uh, you know, the uh, fifth seal. OK. Um, meanwhile, those who are the supposed priests that God never ordained, that God never appointed, they're making a profit. Hence, they don't teach sound doctrine. They avoid all kinds of stuff that they should be teaching on, etc., etc. And what does it say here in verse 14? You know, what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? That they see nothing in it for themselves to do what they're supposed to be doing with the titles that they've given themselves, with the positions they've given themselves, right? It's, and then, again, let's go back to verse 15. We call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness are raised up. They tempt God and go free. Ultimately, they're not going to go free. This passage, verse 8 through 10 in Malachi, has been taken out of context. You have to read the whole book. Okay? And God wanted me to just touch on all this. Um, and, and he led me through my research to this passage in Hebrews, because I forgot about this completely. Uh, I'll be honest, I did. Um, 
But yeah, there's the justification right there for those of us who are the Church of Philadelphia, who are in the fivefold ministry, who are the sons of Levi, who are in the priesthood, who hold offices, um, and who have given up our, our lives basically for to God. We are a living sacrifice to, to the Lord, living um, in full time ministry. It says it right here. We are we have a commandment to receive the tithes from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren. So, are you supposed to tithe? And tithe just means 10%. That's between you and the Lord, ultimately, right? Obviously. Um, but the, the point is, is, you're not supposed to be tithing to these institutions, these infiltrated churches that God never ordained, God never anointed, God never appointed. I'm having some digestive issues. I, I gotta go. Um... You're supposed to be praying and asking the Lord, one, if you're supposed to give, how much you're supposed to give, and who you're supposed to give it to. Not just writing a check out to the church of so-and-so down the street. Brick and mortar church so-and-so that's probably run by Freemasons, Nephilim, etc. Which is warlocks, which all overlap, by the way. Okay? So I hope I've made the points clear. I'm sorry I have to rush off here, but I'm, I'm not feeling well right now. I need to go. So, um... If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out with curious questions in the comments or via email. If you're going to send me nasty attacking emails, I'm just going to delete them and block you. So just beware. Don't even waste your time. Um, but yeah, tithing is supposed to be done by the Lord's leading, number one, always. And number two, it's supposed to go to those that the Lord has truly anointed and appointed, launched, activated, and empowered in their offices, in the priesthood. And it takes discernment. It takes being connected to the Lord to recognize who those people are. Okay? It's not to the tax exams 5013C infiltrated, you know, government supervised church on the corner. It's to those that God has truly anointed and appointed. Um, okay. I gotta go. I bless you all in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth.